Okay, tonight we want to finish up Proverbs chapter 2. Go ahead and turn to verse 20. I'm going to do 20, 21, and 22, Lord willing. And don't look ahead in the outline, because I have a question here in just a second. See, so the, first, the, the first thing you do is look ahead in the outline when I tell you, you don't look ahead. You just said 220, and I'm yeah. right here. Yeah, so don't look ahead. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Proverbs 2.20. <laughs> that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Okay, so Solomon has already shown us the dangers of the evil man and the strange woman, and now he goes on to show us the blessings that we'll get if we, uh, if we get wisdom. And this is the part I didn't want you to look ahead for. So does anybody notice anything weird, strange, about verse 20? I know Judy does. We've talked about this before. Does anybody else notice anything odd, different? About the mayest walk? Mm-hmm. The, yeah. Uh, Mayest walker. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is that it? <clears throat> well, not not exactly. One thing that stands out to me is that men is like in italics. Yeah. That yeah. no, that's not why. Is it a complete sentence? The whole verse is a complete yeah. sentence with a comma in the middle. <clears throat> but is it actually? I mean, I know it starts with a capital letter and ends with a period. But is that a complete sentence if it was all by itself? No. Your subject. There's your verb. It's not, it's not, not by itself. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Like there should be something, something before that, right? Because it's just kind of like, it's a fragment, essentially. And you think, well, how can you have a fragmented sentence in the Bible? It's inspired by God, right? How can you have a sentence that's not even a sentence? That's improper grammar. <clears throat> well, it actually is proper grammar. And I'm going to show you why that is. So it all has to do with the context. And this sentence is using what you call an ellipsis. Uh, and an ellipsis is a grammatical function. What is that? Can we look now? You can look now, yes, yes. <clears throat> so an ellipsis is a grammatical function, and it here's the definition of it. It is the omission of one or more words in a sentence which would be needed to complete the grammatical construction or fully to express the sense. So in a sentence that uses an ellipsis, there are missing words in it. But the missing words are implied by the context. Like you would, you would, as you were reading it, and you're reading it along with the rest uh, of the context, you would put the words into it in your mind that should be there. And I'll, I'll show you how this would work in this verse. So the things that were spoken earlier, such as the acquisition of wisdom, knowledge, discretion, and understanding which deliver a man from the e- from evil men and strange women, they are the prerequ- prerequisites necessary to walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. So if we read this verse like it would have read if it was being written all by itself with the, the information that, that had preceded it in the verse to make it a complete sentence, then it would read something like this. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, to deliver thee from the strange woman, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men, and keep the paths of the righteous. So that, it's like all that information there is assumed in the verse. Because in order to walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous, We are given wisdom to enter into our heart, which delivers us from evil men and strange women, that we may walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. So all that previous information is implied in there, in that ellipsis. I'll give you another, you got a question? Well, I I guess I thought you were going to say that verse 20, an example of how it would read would be that I have given you the, the foregoing warning or I have given I have told you all that stuff that thou mm-hmm. mayest walk mm-hmm. in it's kind of um, right and and so you could summarize it the way that you did I was kind of putting all that information in there mm-hmm. but yeah that's that's the point that yeah. all of this foregoing stuff was said that thou mayest walk in the way of good men mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. yep when did you learn about ellipsis well, as a matter of fact, I was listening to Pastor Mott's sermon that he's doing currently, series on Psalm 136, 
and he made this point about an ellipsis being used. This was one of those things. I didn't know what the name of the grammatical function was, but when I read through there, and I noticed a long time ago that that's not a complete sentence, and I, I knew intuitively that that's the answer, that it's the, the information preceding it is implied in it, but I, I couldn't explain it. I didn't know the, the word. But uh, Psalm 136 is another example. If you look at Psalm 136, and this is a, a clear cut and a much simpler example. Uh, Psalm 136. I don't want to belabor this point too much, but this will really make it, make it plain here. So let me just read the first three verses. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. So in the first three verses there, he says, O give thanks unto the Lord of unto the Lord, O give thanks unto the God of gods, O give thanks to the Lord. And then in verse four, now you have an ellipsis. He doesn't say, O give thanks again, because he doesn't need to say, O give thanks again. Your mind puts that in there. You understand that it's supposed to be there. If it weren't for the ellipsis, it would say, verse four would say, O give thanks to him who alone doeth great wonders. O oh, give thanks to him that by wisdom made the heavens, verse 5, and on and on. So that phrase there is implied. And then as you go down, so that's in verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 13, 16, 17. And then you go down here to verses, um, <clears throat> verse 23, and now the ellipsis gets even longer because now it takes out additional information. So the ellipsis used to be, oh, give thanks. And then all those other verses started off with to him that something. But now when you get down to 23, who remembered us in our lowest state for his mercy endureth forever. That's not a complete sentence. But in the context here with the ellipsis, it is. It would be, oh, give thanks to him who remembered us in our lowest state. And then verse 25, it would be, oh, give thanks to him who giveth food to all flesh. Now, <coughs> So that, I think, 136 makes the ellipsis a lot more simple and understandable than it is in Proverbs chapter 2, but the same thing is, is going on in both of those. So I just thought I would add that in there and um, clear up any misunderstanding. I never thought of it, so 136. Yeah. It, never, I... it never dawned on me either. Wow. And, and once you see it, then it's totally obvious and when you read it it's not like oh I can't understand this sentence because it's only a fragment <laughs> you know it your mind is your mind you know puts the words in there and you, you understand what it's saying okay so then let's get back to the Proverbs 2 <clears throat> that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous so I would say that was providential that I happened to hear that sermon on Psalm 136 because it just happened to be the answer to this verse here in Proverbs 2. So walking in the way of good men is living a life that's both guided by God and pleasing to him. And Psalm 37:25 tells us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Right? So Proverbs 2 is referring to the good man, walking in the way of the good man, and this is what Psalm 37 is telling us as, way, as well. So walking in the way of the good man is walking in the Lord's ways, walking in the ways that he's ordered for you. And then so the possession of wisdom then leads a man to good company, and then that in turn makes him wiser yet, because when you walk with wise men, you, they rub off on you, you get wiser. Remember Proverbs 13.20, uh, it says that he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So it's um, it's when you first take that when you when you get wise enough to walk on the right path, then you're wise. But then when you get on the right path, and then you start living and and being friends with other wise people or wiser people, hopefully, then they make you yet wiser as well. <clears throat> so that's why it's really important to to. Pick your friends carefully, right? Pick your church carefully. You just don't go to any church, right? You go to a church where the truth is taught and believed, and then you'll be yet wiser. 
so Solomon here is talking about the way of good men, walking in the way of good men. So let's just see how the Bible defines what a good man is. And I'm, I just have the verses printed out here, and I'll just read through them. I we don't have to turn there. But the scripture describes a good man as being seven different things. <clears throat> so in Psalm 112, 5, it says that a good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Psalm 12, 2, I'm sorry, Proverbs 12, 2, it says a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Uh, Proverbs 14, 14, a good man should be satisfied from himself. Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, or bringeth forth good things in this case. Uh, I think that that's a different gospel that I was thinking of there. Acts eleven twenty four talked about Barnabas, said that he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And then Romans 5, 7 tells us that for a good man, some would even dare to die. <clears throat> right? It says that Christ commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so if we, <clears throat> so we, given those verses then, let's extrapolate out the information out of them. So therefore, the good man who walks in the way of good men, he will be generous towards the poor yet wise when helping them. Remember that he showeth favor and lendeth, but he guides his affairs with discretion. He'll be blessed to the Lord because it says he obtaineth favor of the Lord, right? He'll manage and save his money so that he has enough to leave not only to his children, but to his grandchildren because he leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Uh, he will not depend on others nor material wealth for satisfaction because it says that he should be satisfied from himself. Right? So he's got everything within himself um, based on the, the grace that God's given him to be happy with himself. He doesn't need um, uh, things or other people or anything else. He could be satisfied just by himself. Uh, he will treasure up good in his heart and bring it forth for the benefit of others in due time. Remember, it says that he, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. He'll be full of the Holy Spirit and faith, like Barnabas was, being a good man. And, and here's the one that really, this will make you think, he'll have friends who love him so dearly that they would lay down their lives for him. You think about that. I mean, I was thinking about that today. I'm thinking, boy, do I have friends that would lay down their life for me? And we all say, oh yeah, I'd do that. But then you think... I got a family to take care of too. You know, would I really lay down my life for somebody else? And then that makes you think about how much Jesus loved us because he laid down his life for his friends because he told his disciples that I call you friends. And <clears throat> so you think about that. Um, that's a man, the God man that loves us because he would lay down his life for us. So yeah, that if you have all those things, if you have any of those things, the Bible says you're a good man. If you have all of them, then you're a really good man, right? The more of those things you have, the more gooder of a man you are. Excuse me, Pastor. So the friends would die for him, not he would die for his friends, right? Right. They yeah, they would die for him, oh. because it says that um, for a good man, some would even dare to die in Romans five. So the question is, would your friends die for you? Uh, was any of the disciples wanted to, like, thought about dying for Jesus Christ when he was alive? That, Peter did, I suppose. He said he would, yeah. <laughs> but then, but then, he, then, denied he, but then <laughs> he denied him as soon as the heat got turned up. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's easy to say you'd die for somebody else. It's it's you, different to do it. You think about that, but you think <clears throat> more about dying for your wife, not mm-hmm. for another man. Right, right. Yeah, and yeah, I think most people would die for their wives, you I would hope. You think about dying for a friend, you would, you would definitely yeah. do it for your wife. I'm not going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. You, and, but a lot of people in the Army, like storing beaches and stuff, lots of people die for their friends. Or, yep. You know, I remember about that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And in those cases, it's like it's almost like you have no other choice almost. Yeah. You know, like, like people that dive on a grenade to save people, I think it's almost an impulse yeah, thing maybe where... Yeah, going to get you anyway, so you're yeah. just trying to minimize the damage. Yeah. Yeah, not to minimize people that die for their friends in war, but sometimes when you don't really have much of a choice, it's a little different than if you could, like Jesus, choose to die for your friends whenever you didn't have to. You know, when you get drafted versus joining your own accord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah. that Peter meant it when he said it. Um, yeah. and he might have been impulsive. Um, he was, I guess, impulsive, but still, I mean, that whole 
thing had to be so heavy and so fearsome that sticking to what you were resolved to do earlier would be oh yeah oh especially when you see what's happening to them and yeah so there's another thing that can uh, come from walking alongside good men and that is that you'll end up being protected from danger out there and, and be blessed in your life and I just give you what four examples of this so remember Lot Abraham's pardon me Abraham's nephew it was said there in Genesis 1929 excuse me I got the hiccups now it's always nice when you're trying to speak uh, Genesis 1929 Lot was blessed because of Abraham, <clears throat> not because Lot was such a good guy. Lot wasn't anything to write home about, <clears throat> although he was a righteous man. It says he was a just man, and yet he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, we're told. Genesis uh, nineteen twenty nine, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that was where Sodom and Gomorrah was, were, uh, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of, of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Who'd God remember? Abraham. He didn't remember Lot. He remembered Abraham, and he delivered Lot for Abraham's sake. So whenever you hang out with good people like Abraham, sometimes the Lord will spare you for Abraham's sake. That's why it's a good thing to spend time with good people. Uh, Genesis 30 and verse 27, Laban, who was pretty well a scoundrel, uh, he was blessed because he hung out with another scoundrel named Jacob. <laughs> Jacob was had God's favor. Uh, Genesis 30 and verse 27 says, And Laban said unto him, that's to Jacob, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. When Jacob was there, Laban's flocks were bringing forth in abundance and and and. Like I said, even Jacob was a little bit wily himself with some of the, the things that he pulled. But he was still God's man. And because of that, his uncle Laban was blessed. Then you have Potiphar. I don't think I'll read this passage, but you remember Potiphar. Whenever Joseph was put in charge of Potiphar's house, Potiphar's house was blessed because of Joseph. Because Joseph was a good man. And then I'll give you one more example. In Acts 27, in verse 24... Even criminals, and who knows, these guys could have been murderers and thieves and just the horrible people. We, don't, we, don't, we weren't told what they did, but they were being shipped back to Rome to be tried, I'm assuming with the Apostle Paul. And typically, if you're being shipped the whole way across the seas to go back to Rome to be tried, it probably wasn't because, you know, you, um, you took a pencil that didn't belong to you, right? It probably was from some serious crime. But these guys' lives were spared because of their traveling companion, because of Paul. Uh, Acts 27, verse 24. This is <clears throat> when the Lord came to Paul that night and spoke to him. It says, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. And there was, I think it was 200, 276 I forget where the, I don't see it here, but anyway, I think there was 276 criminals on that boat, and the Lord gave them all with Paul, because... 37, verse 37. Verse 37. There you go, yep, 203 score and 16, so 276, yep. <clears throat> so, there are benefits, even if you're a criminal, to <laughs> hanging out. If you end up in jail sometime, then, you know, try to bunk up with with some good man that got falsely accused and put in there or something. Except everyone in jail is innocent until proven Well, they are. Guilty. They, and and even after they're proven guilty, they're still innocent, according mm -hmm. to most of them. Anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there probably are some that didn't do it, for sure. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> See, if Jeffrey Epstein would have been in a, would have, would have been in a uh, cell with the Apostle Paul, he might still be alive today. Mm. <laughs> mm. That is, if the Clintons didn't get Paul transferred out of the cell first and then turn the cameras off before they murdered him. But if they did, I'm not saying they did, but whoever 